Hello, I'm Virginia Eskin, and this is First Ladies of Music, a series celebrating women who have carved out new territory for themselves and left legacies that have influenced all who have followed. In First Ladies of Music, we will show how much we owe these women, past and present, and you will hear their music. Today we're going to explore music by women from the 1930s. Our first example is Marion Bauer, born in 1887 and lived till 1955. Very important composer in the canon of American music and a very important woman composer because she led a very importantly productive and constructive life. She was an extremely academic person. She wrote an important book called 20th Century Music with Ethel Pizer. She was the editor of Etude magazine. And then on top of it, she composed her own music. She comes out of what we sometimes call the Second New England School. Bauer is a descendant of McDowell's emphasis on coloristic harmony, programmatic titles, narrative forms, in other words, the way he would compose things that reflected maybe New Hampshire or woodland little flowers. Marion Bauer does the same thing. She's written suites based on New Hampshire mountains or woodsides. So in a sense, we would call her a true colorist in sound. Her music is architectural. It's very mathematical in that way. And I like to think of the sound coming out of the Art Deco period, you know, the way when you look at the Empire State Building, it rises very logically, and Marion Bauer's music is like that. So in trying to think of her music, it's very sturdy, it's very architectural. On top of it, she weaves in a beautiful kind of sensual line and saves it from being just all black and white. Her life included a wonderful friendship with Marion McDowell, who was the widow of Edward McDowell and started the McDowell Colony. In fact, she went to the McDowell Colony 12 times between the years 1919 and 1944. And there's a wonderful quote where she calls it, a haven where other composers, writers, and painters have shared with me the extraordinary opportunity and privilege of doing creative work in peaceful, stimulating, and beautiful surroundings. There's a small piano prelude that was never published, and I'd like you to listen to what she does because Atonality is sometimes considered a bad word in music. It just means against the tone. You put tones together that should not be put together, like this. But when you do that in the hands of a master, it becomes extremely beautiful. Listen to how she blends it all. You just heard Marion Bauer's first piano prelude in D, Opus 15, number one. And all of her music lives at the Library of Congress. So if you're interested in researching her, go for it. Now I'd like you to hear the first movement of Bauer's violin sonata. It's entitled Fantasia Quasi Una Sonata. It's just a wonderful trajectory 
of this, what I was talking about before, the idea of music being built on big blocks of sound, but at the same time, she threads a beautiful narrative all around it, so you get extremely strong music, and it's a pleasure to play. Listen to the first movement here of Bauer's Violin Sonata.
You just heard the first movement of Marion Bauer's Violin Sonata, played by Irina Murashanu and Virginia Eskin. Now we're going to move to a very interesting woman named Mana Zuka. That's not her real name. She was born Augusta Zuckerman and lived practically to be 100 years old. She changed her name so it said to sound more exotic. She wrote a lot of music, probably six, 700 pieces in her oeuvre. She was popular in her time, played a lot of her music and had it played. When you're a composer, and especially a woman, it takes a lot of pushiness to get your orchestral music played. Judging by the programs and all the stuff that she had published, she was out there, as we would say today. Unfortunately, none of her music is recorded. And so what I'm going to do is play two short piano pieces so you can get the flavor because some people would say it's derivative. I don't think so. I think what it is is a mirror of the times. This kind of music is now being re-examined and it's being reappreciated. but I think she'd be pleased to know that her music is being taken seriously. So what I'm going to play for you now is a little intermezzo that she wrote. So that was sort of interesting, don't you think? That's the intermezzo by Manazuka. And what I've been talking about is the fact that the music is very well built. It's not easy to play, but it's very accessible. And yet it has a kind of a dark brick-on-brick -brick quality, and it's very pleasing to listen to. Now here's a little paraphrase that Manazuka whipped out, and this appeared in Etude magazine. And I remember I was just talking about that because our former composer, Marian Bauer, was the editor of Etude. In fact, she was the editor when this edition in 1927 appeared. So that's sort of a nice little connection. This is called Ailey Ailey, and it's a paraphrase on the Jewish lament, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Manazuka sets the music in traditional Jewish style. This piece became an immense success for her. She never had it copyrighted, so she didn't make any money from it but it was widely played. What she's done is put a whole lot of fancy stuff into it. The melody is there, but she puts in almost what we call movie star quality, lots of runs and arpeggios, and that's to sort of glamorize the music. Here's Ailey Ailey.
That was Ailey Ailey by Manazuka. Now we move to Ruth Crawford. She was born in 1901 and died in 1953. She was a very complicated person, unrealized in a sense. She died on the youngish side, was unrecognized, left behind a very small oeuvre of extraordinarily high quality. I'm going to start with a prelude because preludes were something that composers in the 30s loved to compose. Of course, Bach wrote the great ones, Debussy. But then what happened in the 20th century is that preludes returned, and it's a small form, so a composer can make his point or her point very quickly. And Ruth Crawford composed nine preludes based on intervals, like a third, a fourth, and she loved sevenths and ninths, as did other composers of the modern period, it's sometimes called the 30s. These preludes that she wrote have a very sort of mystical quality, and that comes back to her early personality. She grew up in Chicago, and that's when she composes the bulk of the music that we regard so highly today. She had letters of introduction to Schoenberg. She eventually makes her way to Europe, and it wasn't until she met the man she would marry that she actually believed in herself. She was a very fine pianist, and the reason I know that is because the piano preludes are devilishly hard to play. She returned eventually from Europe and marries Charles Seeger, but I'd like to talk about that in a minute. I want you to listen, first of all, to this piano prelude. I'm not going to play the whole thing because they're recorded, but when we talk about her early sort of mystical personality, just listen to these few bars of her prelude and you'll see what I'm talking about. The music is written with three staves. And when composers who are intellectual, as Ruth Crawford was, write music that is not inviting, what happens is that people usually don't play it. Now, because she's an important woman and eventually marries Charles Seeger, he has been married before and he has a son named Pete Seeger, the famous folk singer, and they give birth to Peggy Seeger and Mike Seeger, and there's a whole dynasty. And what you have then is a very interesting life Ruth Crawford starts to emerge then. She gives up somewhat, composing this moonal, mystic music. Reality sinks in, and she has to then give up composing the intellectual music. She has to make a living. It's fortunate and unfortunate, because what happens is that she gets behind folk music. But before we go to that, let's just roll back a little bit and listen to a movement from her suite for four strings and piano, She's got a foot kind of in both camps. You'll hear those jagged, atonal clusters I'm talking about, but she's also trying to make music that people can listen to and relate to. It has more of a structure. Here's the last movement from Ruth Crawford's Suite for Four Strings and Piano.
You just heard the last movement of Ruth Crawford's Suite for Four Strings and Piano, played by the Charleston Quartet and your host. We're talking about Ruth Crawford, and as I said before, she had a kind of a two-part life. Part of it was that dreamy, mystical side, and she was very adventuresome, but then after she got married, she has to bring some money into the family, and she taught in Washington, D.C., and she was hired in the WPA as part of the project to go and do what we call oral histories. They grabbed sound recording equipment, and the Smithsonian paid for this, and they went down into Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia in the South, and they recorded and spoke to, you'd call them hillbilly country people who sang these wonderful old-fashioned songs. And the only reason we know how those songs go and what the words sound like is because Ruth Crawford left the mystical, intellectual side of her life and did that. So she emerges as a very important Americanist and explains a lot about our own American culture. Now we're going to end our little segment here with Crawford, and we're going to go back to the more intellectual side. It's this wonderful piece called Mixed Accents. A long time ago, a scholar gave me a copy of this piece, and I looked at it, and I thought, this is a nightmare. What on earth did Ruth Crawford have in mind? There are no bar lines. There is no form, but there are these assaults on the piano, and I thought, there's got to be a mathematical conclusion to this. What she's done is write, she was in love with intervals, remember I told you that? She writes a third, a fourth, back to a seventh, a ninth, a second, a first, back to an eighth. And then what you do is you write down that sequence, it's like a sentence, and you realize this is not crazy music, these are sentences in sound. So that's why she gets a big star for being an innovator. Listen to Mixed Accents by Ruth Crawford. That was Mixed Accents, played by Rosemary Platt, composed by Ruth Crawford. You're listening to First Ladies of Music. We'd love to hear from you. You can send your comments via email to ladies at wfmt.com. You're listening to the WFMT Radio Network. Welcome back to First Ladies of Music. Now we come to Rebecca Clark, very interesting woman, British for half of her life, and then when she comes to America, she marries and stays here. Long life, 1886 to 1979. She didn't have a good childhood in the sense that her father was not encouraging of her to be a musician, but she said, I'm going to do it anyway. She was a fine violist. She composed all of her important music in the early years before the 1940s. Once she comes to America, she doesn't ever compose again. So let's listen to a little bit of music by Rebecca Clark. This is the prelude for viola and clarinet that was composed in 1941. <laughs>
You just heard the prelude for viola and clarinet, played by Patricia McCarty on viola, and Peter Hadcock was the clarinetist. We're talking about Rebecca Clark and how once she comes to this country, she sort of really abandons composing. That prelude you just heard comes from that sort of interesting period. Now we're going to listen to a work that is beloved by violists, and I'd like to tell you the story behind Rebecca Clark's Viola Sonata. She wrote it, and it is her most complicated and ambitious work, and entered it under a nom de plume, was Anthony Trent, in the Coolidge competition back in 1919. The jury was deadlocked. Apparently the work had tied with a suite for viola and piano by the famous composer Ernest Bloch. And Mrs. Coolidge listened to all the works, and she's the woman who started the famous Library of Congress concerts. She was to cast the deciding vote for the Bloch. The jury insisted on knowing who had written the runner-up work. The winning work was the work of a philosopher, that's the Bloch, but the other work was that of a poet. And were they surprised to learn that it was written by a woman? And that, of course, was our Rebecca Clark. That says to us that like all the women on this program, her music is very strong. It doesn't sound feminine or salon-like or something that was backup music for a silent film. Au contraire, it's very beautifully worked out, extremely mathematical. It's got a, a sort of a whole rationale. We're going to end the program with the first movement of Rebecca Clark's Sonata for Viola and Piano, Impetuoso.
You've listened to the first movement of the Sonata for Viola and Piano by Rebecca Clark. Patricia McCarty was the violist, and I was the pianist. I'm Virginia Eskin, inviting you to join me again next time for First Ladies of Music, when we will bring you a program on women involved in the jazz world and living women who are striking out as performance artists. First Ladies of Music with Virginia Eskin is produced by Carolyn Pollan for 98.7 WFMT and the WFMT Radio Network. Steve Robinson is the executive producer. The engineer is Mary Mazurik. Thanks to Alice Abraham, librarian at WGBH Radio in Boston. And special thanks to Boston's Northeastern University for their generous support. I'm Virginia Eskin, inviting you to join me again next time for First Ladies of Music. This is the WFMT Radio Network.